Hi Singapore, this is National Swimmer Joseph Schooling. Catch the latest news on Team Singapore on 938 Live. From 938 Live. This is Formula One driver Fernando Alonso. Hi Singapore, I'm Jürgen Klinsmann. Hi, I'm Martin Tyler. This is Annika Sorenstein. Hi Singapore, this is Johnny Wilkinson. You're locked on to the best in sports. Cheers. You're listening to Singapore's longest-running and only sports talk show and radio. Welcome to Sports Zone on 93 Live. I'm your host Raj Kumar, and after 16 years, today is the final edition of Sports Zone. 16 years since the station first started transmitting on this frequency, and we've been on air every Saturday morning. And this is our final show because Sports Zone takes an indefinite break after today. And what a way to end the show with three extremely high-profile individuals from the local sports community. They are here to talk about our staging of the 20th edition of the Southeast Asian Games in June plus a few other local sports uh, issues. So in the studio today is the CEO of Sports Singapore in Lim Teck Yin. He's joined by the chef Dimishon of Team Singapore's contingent at the Sea Games in Dr. Tan Ing Liang. And completing the lineup is the former CDM for the 2014 Commonwealth Games and the current president of, the Sing- of Singapore's rugby union, Lao Tio Ping. And just before we, we get this discussion underway, just to let you know that we'll be giving away two new video games for the Xbox One gaming console. They are Far Cry 4, and Lego Batman 3 Beyond Gotham. We're also giving away exclusive t-shirts and merchandise from the upcoming blockbuster game Evolve. All of these prizes are courtesy of our friends from Ubisoft, 2K Games and In- Ingram Games. So that's happening in the second part of the show. For now though, uh, Lim Tech In, let's begin uh, with you first as we'll spend the first half of the show talking about the 20th edition of the Southeast Asian Games. We are now less than six months to the start of the Games in Singapore and just two days ago, the organising committee of the Games held a media conference on a few issues. Uh, you were there. Could you kindly bring us up to speed on the key details that were highlighted? Well, thank you very much, Raj. Um, we are at the final stretch of our preparations uh, with less than 138 days to go. It's 138 days to the 5th of June, Mm. but as you know, some of the preliminary matches for the football competition will start earlier than that on the 29th of May. Mm -hmm. So everything right now I'm glad to report is on track, our planning is on track, and our our team is raring to go. Uh, Just the other day we announced that the ticket sales for the opening ceremony for those who had uh, expressed interest to buy the tickets Mm. have gone out live. And at the end of this month, we will go live with the sale of tickets for the sports competitions. I think we are going to see a ramp up of community engagement activities Mm. uh, with a rally for one team Singapore down at Orchard Road on the 7th of March. So I think uh, we are all set and raring to go for the Games and I hope the people of Singapore are raring to go as well. I'm sure we all are. And uh, could you clarify the number of uh, hotels... (coughs) number of hotels involved in terms of hosting the athletes from the 11 countries and uh, just exactly how many athletes and officials are we expecting? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to say that the hoteliers in Singapore have stepped forward on our 50th anniversary and have been eager to take part. We have selected 20 of these hotels all around the city, mm. uh, looking, taking into consideration their proximity to competition venues and the number of rooms that they could offer uh, for us. Uh, our planning parameters are looking at about 7,000 athletes and officials in total. Okay. Uh, the concept of having a games village in the combined areas of Havelock, Tanjung Paga and Marina Bay, it is a pretty unique yet challenging concept from every aspect possible. I mean, from transportation of the athletes and even security at the hotels. Uh, are we deploying extra manpower from uh, the armed forces, for example, to assist with the police and other security forces? Well, I'd, I'd like to say that this is not the first time uh, that we've adopted this approach uh, when hosting the SEA Games in Singapore. So mm. we do have a... Uh, previous experience in doing this. Mm. I think our uh, security agencies have taken a very comprehensive look at all the security requirements and are working very closely Mm. with the hoteliers and other venues in and around the city and at the competition venues to assure ourselves that we are providing adequate security coverage for the Games. Uh, As far as other logistical requirements, there's obviously a challenge when you have greater dispersion across a larger geographical space. Mm. Uh, but uh, I think the other way to look at this is we don't have a single point of failure in any particular regard. And as I said, our hoteliers and all the people in charge of admin and logistics are on board to make this a one-team Singapore event. Tegin, how are you going to ensure that the athletes who are staying in the financial district will actually not get stuck in traffic peak hour, especially if their competition venues are around Singapore and uh, away from the sports hub? Well, we, we do know the traffic patterns in Singapore and we are working very closely with the LTA to ensure that we give adequate time for mm. athletes to get to their different venues. 
Okay. Let's now bring in the chef de mission, uh, Dr. Tan Ying Liang, into this uh, discussion. Uh, at the recent two-day visit by all of the, the CDMs of the competing countries in Singapore, what was the one component or element which most of them agreed about us hosting the Games or probably even most uh, looking forward to? Well, I must say that uh, uh, the CDM uh, meeting was chaired by Tekin. Mm. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, it was unanimous. And if you read the newspaper, mm. the conclusion was that Singapore is ready mm. and can host the SEA Games. We are talking on sports, the 36 sports, the 402 events, mm and the venue. Mm. Uh, they're all ready and the Cambodian chef division was quoted to say that we can hold it tomorrow mm -hmm. if Singapore wants to. So as far as I think the uh, sports area, mm. we are extremely happy that we are, we are almost there except for a few venues. Yeah. Uh, so we, we are relatively confident that uh, we will be able to put up a good show. Yeah. That's uh, that's great to hear. Now yourself and Nick Fang are the CDMs for Team Singapore. I believe it's the first time we have uh, two CDMs. How will the two of you share the responsibilities of leading the overall contingent? Well, the, the main reason is uh, this being a home uh, SEA Games mm. and we are anticipating you know, from the selection uh, from our visits to the different NSA mm this will probably be the largest Singapore contingent to any major game. Now, uh, we are looking at about 650 athletes, mm. about 400 officials. So we are talking of just over a thousand and this will be the largest contingent you know, that mm. has been selected for any major games. So um, as far as the chef de mission responsibility, uh, I've told uh, Nicholas that it is free and easy, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would, I think, uh, arrange, for example, you know, there are certain activity that if, we'll, if you would like to do it, for example, the every morning chef the mission meeting, mm. uh, he can handle it. There's mm. no need for two of us. And uh, we have, I think, uh, discussed certain areas of uh, responsibility but most of the time because we'll be together and 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 in the same place whoever is in a position you know, mm. to exercise that responsibility do so so there's no hard and fast rule as far as I'm concerned Let's hear now from Mr. Lao Tio Ping and having been a chef de mission for Team Singapore on several occasions including the 2014 Commonwealth Games is there anything that the organisers did, did in Glasgow which we, we can adapt and implement in Singapore for our hosting of the games. From yes, the definitely, uh, Raj. In fact, one of the things that stood out spectacularly at the Glasgow Games was the community involvement. Mm. Uh, with a theme that they adopted, people make Glasgow. It really resonated with a lot of the people, including even the people outside Glasgow itself. And when we were there, mm. you could see all the smiles of the people on the streets, uh, people coming up wanting to t take photographs, ask us where we came from. Mm. And hopefully, I think, uh, with a theme like that, plus also followed by another one which says, bring the bring the games on, mm. uh, it really ma made it a very welcoming kind of games in which hopefully we can do the same in Singapore and hopefully the people in Singapore would also come forward and really be great hosts, mm. not only to our uh, the athletes coming from overseas, but also, in fact, be supporting our own athletes as they perform. So I think if that can really happen, I think we will have achieved a tremendous uh, 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 lap, a leap forward in terms of community bonding and getting people very much involved with sports. As one of the, the current four vice presidents in the Singapore National Olympic Council, are you expecting a tough selection and approval process for the Republic's athletes when the time draws near? Well, the fact that we are uh, hosting the games does not mean that we're just going to open the floodgates. <laughs> uh, no, we have been at this uh, process of selection for for a long time, and we will still be looking at uh, you know uh, athletes who can perform and athletes who have 
committed themselves. Having said that, I believe we will in fact see a greater number of athletes ever before mm. because of the fact that uh, the preparatory work by a lot of the NSAs and the athletes have actually begun quite some time ago. And with the help that we got from Sports SG and also the SNOC, I th- I, I do believe that a lot of them will qualify on the criteria that we have set in terms of selecting them for the Games. You're listening to Sports Zone on 93 Live. And today it's all about regional sports in the countdown to the 2015 SEA Games. And in the studio today is the CEO of Sports Singapore in Lim Teck In. He's joined by the chef de mission of Team Singapore's contingent at the SEA Games in Dr. Tan Ing Liang. And completing the lineup is the former CDM for the 2014 Commonwealth Games and the current president of Singapore's rugby union, Lao Tio Ping. Now, uh, Mr. Tan, you're also one of the four VPs at the SNOC. And uh, together with Mr with the president uh, in Tan Chuan Jin and other key members, uh, you just mentioned that we are expecting a contingent of slightly more than a 1,000 for the athletes and officials. In your opinion, uh, would the key criteria for selection depend on the athlete's potential to deliver in June or the athlete's past accomplishments or his current performances? Uh, we, we normally visit the NSAs. Mm. Uh, we have a committee that goes around and... Uh, and every time when we go to an NSA, we remind them of the selection criteria. Hmm. The key criterion is third placing of the last SEA Games. Okay. So in terms of time or in terms of performance, hmm. right? Hmm. Now, in fact, the selection normally is done with the officials from sports, uh, SG, and hmm. also with the SNOC. And in fact, they just had the, uh, a run-through hmm. Because the, all the nominees for the 2015 SEA Games are in. Mm. And just two, three days ago, they went through the selection process. And uh, the good news is that uh, quite a number has already qualified mm. based on this third placing. But there are other criteria that we have told them that if you are close to the third placing, for example, if you are 2% off you know, the time and so on, yeah. it will still be considered. You know. So I think uh, we are expecting uh, quite a few that will qualify, mm. but we will also exercise uh, discretion that those that are near the selection, I think, criteria and have the potential, mm. I think they will also be considered for selection. La Tioping, since the Republic has never top the medal tally in the history of the SEA Games, is it safe to say that despite our home ground advantage, it would be foolish to think that we can actually overcome the perennial favourites like the Indonesians or the Thais. Well, I think having the SEA Games in Singapore definitely does give us some home ground advantage. But mm. I think at the end of the day, mm. this is really a numbers game again. I mean, you know, in terms of uh, the kind of uh, population that we're talking about in, within our neighbourhood, uh, you know, yeah. it's not going to be that easy to surpass but I don't think that's the intent mm. I think more importantly is that our athletes being able to do their best uh, give up their best and also exceed their own performance before they come into the games and I think with that mm. it will definitely go to help uh, resonating with the public and resonating with the people in Singapore and I think that's really what's all about In a related question to take in uh, seeing that we are, we are celebrating the nation's 50th birthday, is it possible for Team Singapore to hit that magical number of 50 goal? 50 is the highest number that the Republic attained, and that was uh, when we last hosted the Games in 1993. Well, Raj, as you have uh, sort of alluded to, mm-hmm. 50 is the magic number. Mm-hmm. 50th birthday, mm-hmm. 50, 50 gold medals, the highest we've ever attained. Yeah. Sounds, on, sounds magical. But yeah. on our 50th birthday, we're looking for the future. Wow. Okay. So together with my colleagues in SNOC, <laughs> we're hoping to get past 50. All right. Okay. <laughs> but don't tell me 51. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Let's touch on some of the key sports and hear your expectations, starting first with a, a sport that can actually draw 55,000 to the National Stadium football. Take in what can we expect from the under-23s, bearing in mind that the Republic has never, never won the football gold medal. Well, football is undeniably the most watched sport in Southeast Asia. And already from just having our discussions with the broadcasters across the region, mm. every single football match will be telecast live across the region and everybody's watching that. 
I visited our football uh, team, our under twenty three football team, several times last year, mm. and I spoke to them very and made it very clear that the weight of responsibility of the nation does indeed rest on their shoulders, and they should embrace that pressure very early on. Mm. I think, uh, looking at the boys, they want to win this. Mm. Uh, they are off to Turkey for a training camp, uh, but I think you know the results are going to very much depend on how much they want this, mm. how much they want to create history on Singapore's fiftieth anniversary. And I think as we draw closer to the games, this will sink in more and more. But the work has got to start now. Uh, Dr. Tan, track and field will probably have more than 40 gold medals at stake and this is the highest for any sporting discipline at any games but the Republic in the last few years has struggled to win more than 5 gold medals in track and field Uh, Are you hoping for our young athletes to defy the odds and deliver at the National Stadium? Well, uh, we have visited the track and field and spoken to the officials Uh, The target is definitely, you know to do better than five, mm. right? Mm. So we are hopeful because there are a number of young women athletes, for example, you know, 17 year old, 18 year old, that are doing extremely well now. Mm. So uh, we are confident that we will be able to achieve mm. uh, better medal goal as well as the total number mm. compared to the last SEA Games. Yeah. Okay. How about our bowlers and table tennis squads? I'm assuming you're going to say that we should be banking on at least 8 to 10 gold medals between d- these two disciplines, bowling and table tennis. No, I personally, as Chef Dimishon, and also from this, the uh, team that visit all these uh, sports, mm. between table tennis and bowling, we'll definitely exceed that number. You know? But the main contributor from our past uh, performances mm. must be from swimming, because swimming is the one that contributes the major, the most number of goals yeah. in the total tally. Um, we'll touch on swimming in a minute. Uh, Lao Teo Ping, and for rugby sevens, uh, will there be competitions for both men and women? And if they are, as the president of the Singapore Rugby Union, what are your expectations of the Republic in rugby sevens? Okay, rugby sevens uh, will be contested at the 28 Sea Games for both men and women. Mm. The last time the sport was uh, contested at the Sea Games was in 2007 in Korat, mm. Thailand. Mm. Uh, our men are the reigning bronze medalists with our girls uh, silver medalists from these games. Mm. Now, uh, both squads, men and women, have been preparing for over a year. And in fact, both teams are up in Darwin next week to face the top international competition as part of the preparations for the games. So they are going into two camps in March and May and one overseas and a local dry run camp that will stimulate uh, simulate game conditions during competitions. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think uh, the preparatory work uh, for these two teams are definitely at high gear. Mm. And our goal is goal for both. And the Singapore Rugby Union is doing all it can to ensure both teams are prepared for the final stretch. Okay, we've got a few more questions on uh, certain other sports, but time now for the news headlines. And when we return, we'll talk more about our Team Singapore Athletes and Vision 2030 with our three studio guests. Plus, it's your chance to win the two new games for the Xbox One gaming console in Far Cry 4 and Lego Batman 3. Uh, Stay tuned to Sports Zone right here on 93 at Live. Hey Singapore, I'm Jasmine young Nathan from Singapore Bowling. For all the latest sports updates, tune in to 93 at Live. You're listening to Sports Zone on 93 Live. I'm Raj Kumar, and today we are counting down to the start of the 2015 Southeast Asian Games in Singapore. And in the studio with me is the CEO of Sports Singapore in Lim Teck Yin. He's joined by the chef de mission of Team Singapore's contingent for the Games in Dr. Taning Liang. And completing the lineup is the former chef de mission for the 2014 Commonwealth Games and the current president of Singapore's rugby union, Lao Teo Ping. And before we continue further about the Sea Games, time now for our phone in contest. So today we are giving away two new games for the X. Xbox One gaming console. It's for the Xbox One gaming console. The two games are Far Cry 4 and Lego Batman 3 Beyond Gotham. We are also giving away exclusive t-shirts and merchandise from the upcoming blockbuster game Evolve. All of these prizes are courtesy of our friends from Ubisoft, 2K Games and Ingram Games. And just before we do our contest, let's hear from Jonathan Toyard, who's the former associate editor at GameSpot. And Jonathan begins by first telling us about the game Far Cry 4. Ah, yes, it is actually a very cool uh, first-person shooter where you actually explore the land of Kairat, which is like around the Himalayas. Uh, you are actually this guy named AJ who has to actually fight 
uh, this try, try to free the land from this uh, tyrant named Pagan Min, a very personable and crazy, unique villain. Um, the gameplay itself is open world, like GTA V. So essentially, you explore this land where you can actually liberate outposts from terrorists. You get to even ride on elephants, actually, and even um, explore the land itself by going on the glide suit or, uh, or using a grappling hook and even use a gyrocopter to fly around the place and everything. It's a very expensive play, a very expensive world you get to explore. Um, imagine like Far Cry 3, the game from a few years back, but with even more verticality involved and a lot more weapons and a lot more things to do, all set in the Himalayas kind of area. So in short, the game answered the previous game's question. The definition, the definition of insanity. Well, Far Cry 4 itself is basically like that and a lot of things to do. So I would actually recommend this game a lot because of the many things you get to do and it actually expands upon the Far Cry formula with this open world shooting gameplay. And John, the other game that we are giving away today is Lego Batman 3 uh, Beyond Gotham. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Oh, yeah. It's actually a continuation of uh, the Lego Batman series. Basically, you are just uh, controlling Batman as he actually explores all around, um, gathering his friends from the Justice League and from the DC Comics to defeat uh, upcoming evil. Uh, there's actually 150 characters to unlock. Uh, it's the typical kind of Lego gameplay where you are set in a level, you defeat any all of uh, Batman's uh, rogue villains, and you solve puzzles back and forth. And there's a bit of a co-op thing, so you can actually, you and your family and your kids can actually play this game together. The game itself is really fun for newbies uh, because of the humor and charm, but if you've been like a follower of the Lego series games, this may not actually entice you so much because it's the same old, same old. Okay, and we're also giving away uh, exclusive merchandise for the upcoming blockbuster game, Evolve. The game is already available for pre-order. What can you tell us about Evolve at this point in time? Oh, at this point in time, they've uh, 2K Games and Total Rock, the developers, have announced extra content. Uh, basically, there'll be DLC that comes out right after the game is out. Uh, I I'm not sure when the date is because they haven't announced it, but the DLC is basically like extra maps, extra monsters and hunters, like the upcoming monster behemoth. Um, right now, they're actually promoting a lot of the, the additions of the game itself. Um, it's trying to follow a free-to-play model like Dota 2 and League of Legends, but it's a bit funny if, since that this is a game you actually pay $60 for. And with this additional money here and there, I just hope that at least the game has some staying power. Otherwise, all this DLC will be for nothing. And that was Jonathan Toyard, who's the former associate editor at, at GameSpot, uh, speaking to me this morning. And now for a chance to win a $150 package of two games for the Xbox One console. We are looking, of course, for two winners. Tell me the answer to this question. In the game Far Cry 4, in which iconic area is the game set in? In Far Cry 4, in which iconic area is the game set in? Is it A, the Grand Canyon, B, the ancient pyramids of Egypt, or C, the Himalayas? The Grand Canyon, the ancient pyramids of Egypt, or C, the Himalayas. Call now, 66911-938, and tell me in which iconic area is the game set in in, the, in uh, Far Cry 4. Let's continue uh, with our discussion on the Sea Games with Dr. Tan Ing Liang, Mr. Lao Teoping, and Mr. Lim Tek Yin. Uh, we left off with uh, Teoping just before the news headlines. Now, as the former chief at Singapore Sailing, uh, are you predicting a clean sweep of all of the gold medals considering our sailors are competing in extremely familiar territory? Well, sailing is a sport in which uh, if you are familiar with your uh, environment, mm. it definitely does come in very useful. Uh, having said that, I think uh, we can also expect uh, the countries of uh, Malaysia and Thailand to also, in fact, uh, be very competitive. Mm. Uh, the last time sailing did well at the SEA Games was at the SEA Games in Manila when they came in with... Uh, seven gold medals out of 12 events. Was this in 2005? Five, yes. yes. Yeah, 10 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So mm. now uh, there are more events that's going to be taking place at the SEA Games in Singapore and I'm sure mm. with the sailors who are also very much uh, experienced in high-level competitions having been doing very well in most of the uh, international uh, regattas, mm. I expect them to continue to uh, do well and I think with the increase in events at the SEA Games, mm. uh, I think they will definitely exceed uh, what has been achieved before. Take in, needless to say that swimming should deliver the medals uh, as, we continue to, as we continue to remain the regional powerhouse, but what about in the other aquatic sports like diving and synchronized swimming? 
Well, I think we've seen our divers and synchronized swimmers make great strides uh, in recent years and mm. credit them to the past lead, present leadership of the Swimming Association, the coaches, the trainers and the athletes themselves. Mm. Uh, I think both our divers and synchronized swimmers have seen podium success at the previous SEA Games and we're looking forward to see them standing right at the top of the podium this time in Singapore. I encourage Singaporeans to get out there, know their names, know their faces, mm. cheer them on. Mr Tan, at these forthcoming games, floorball is officially a medal sport. Two years ago in Myanmar, Singapore won the men's and women's gold medals when the sport was still a demonstration sport. Two years later, can we expect the youngsters to win gold in both floorball events? Well, I think we have been promoting floorball with the regional, regional NOCs. And uh, without any doubt, we are definitely ahead mm. of our neighbouring countries. And not only that, you know, they have been promoting floorball to the schools and they have also participated in regional as well as international. Mm. So uh, we hope that uh, they will be able to uh, maintain their, their form mm. and uh, the gold medal for the men and women, I think, should be within their graphs. To ping a, a quick word on the men's shooting team. Now, seven months ago at the Glasgow Games, they were rather off target while the women backed uh, the gold medals. But with a strong benefit of home advantage, are you expecting all of our shooters to be spot on in uh, five months' time? Well, I think uh, they all have been gearing themselves up. The president of uh, the shooting association, mm. uh, Michael Vass himself, have said that uh, a, lot of have, a lot of them have actually been stepping up their training and their preparations. And I think uh, the women in particular will definitely be doing very well. Mm. So I think we expect uh, a, a much bigger haul uh, from the shooters than before. And before we continue any further, time now to announce our contest winners. I asked you just a few minutes ago, in Far Cry, the game in which iconic area is the game set in? Was it uh, the Grand Canyon? Is it the ancient pyramids of Egypt? Or is it the Himalayas? Uh, of course, the answer the answer is uh, the Himalayas. Congratulations to Teo Chun uh, Teo Chun Ki and Mahindran Munisami. Mahindran also has a message saying that he's a big fan of the show and uh, he'll miss Sports Zone. But uh, nevertheless, congrats, con congrats to Mahindran and Chun Hee. You won for yourselves Far Cry 4 and Lego Batman 3 Beyond Gotham for the Xbox One gaming console. We're also giving away uh, the T-shirts and the merchandise from Evolve. All of these prizes are courtesy of our friends from Ubisoft, 2K Games and Ingram Games. Take in. Let's talk about a sport which is close to your heart and that of uh, Dr. Tan as well because the both of you represented Singapore in water polo. Uh, take in, you competed in six SEA Games campaigns. You hold six gold medals, including an Asian Games bronze from 1986. Uh, Mr. Tan was part of the 1956 Olympic squad in Melbourne. And then in 1958, he and his teammates won a silver at the Asian Games. At present, Singapore's proudest distinction in sports has to be the gold medal winning streak starting from 1965. I'm talking about water polo. Singapore has never lost a water polo match at the Games and uh, in the last 48 years and we've been gold medalists from day one. Take in, what is the main reason you feel we've been a water, water polo powerhouse for almost 50 years now? Well, I think that every generation of water polo player that comes on board the national team is well aware of the legacy that has been established by our predecessors. We understand the weight of responsibility on our shoulders to maintain the winning streak. Mm. We have to work hard, work harder, and work even harder each time. And I think that's really the formula. There is no let up in training and work. In the years that you represented the squad, were there any close shaves or a close call in terms of results at the SEA Games? Well, winning the gold medal and winning every match is never a done deal. There was a particular SEA Games in Jakarta where the Singapore team, uh, my team, were trailing the Indonesian team all the way till the fourth quarter. Mm. It was only the fourth quarter that we managed to tip the scales and win the match. And, you know, as I talked about the legacy, when we looked at the stands and saw the faces of Tan Hui Hock, Tan Eng Bok and Tan Eng Liang, mm. uh, those were more fearsome to us than the Indonesians. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Tan Eng Liang, what do you remember most of your time in representing Singapore in the, in the 1950s? Well, I think, uh, as the King has mentioned, the 50s, 60s and 70s were a fantastic year. And in fact, they built a very strong foundation. Mm -hmm. right? mm. Now, uh, I saw the match where the King was playing. And I also saw another match you know, where Singapore beat Philippines by one goal. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, my only observation is I would like to urge the present uh, water polo management that they must review and really restructure. Mm. Because comparing my time, 50s, 60s and so on, we have a very active clubs, Chinese swimming club, Singapore swimming club. Mm. And, and, and over the years, even in taking time, you know, you have the armed forces, you have the police, you have the Queenstown, and so on. Mm. Now, that is lacking, I think, in the present arrangement. So, while we are fortunate to be able to get our reservoir of players from the schools and the universities, mm. when you leave the universities, if you want to be really still very competitive, that's where the inter-club, you know, that, mm. that, that should be on place. So I would urge the present uh, water flow management mm. to seriously look into reintroducing and then trying to maintain so that we are one step ahead of our neighbours. We should be trying to, I think, at the moment we are fifth or sixth in Asia. Yeah. We should be aiming for maybe fourth, you know, if ideally third. And I think that still requires a lot of work. So I personally am not so confident. Mm. No. Um, Teo Ping, back to you. Uh, you've seen the water polo team in action several times. I, I'm, I'm assuming you're going to say you are confident we will be champions again in five months. Well, yes, I've been a very... Despite, this, despite the rising uh, talents from uh, our neighbours. Yeah. Yes, I've been a keen follower of uh, water polo and I've been watching them. I watched them at the uh, SEA Games in Gorad. I saw them perform recently in Incheon mm. at the Asian Games and I saw them again, you know, uh, training and all. And I believe that uh, they have now decided to set, set their sights for Asian Games level kind of competition, which I think bodes well. And I think with that, uh, no doubt the other teams in Southeast Asia are also kind of uh, closing the gap. Mm. But I think if the water polo team here in Singapore uh, do not rest on their laurels of just SEA Games stardom and work towards, like what Dr. Tan mm. has just mentioned, mm. aim towards a fourth or third placing. Mm. I mean, their game against Kazakhstan in Incheon, I think was marvellous. Mm. They did exceptionally well and, you know, they missed it just by a very small margin. And I think uh, we, we do have a group of people who are very much, I think, interested in wanting to be in the Asian space rather than just the Southeast Asian space. Okay, before we go to our traffic update, take in a quick word on the women's team. They won the very first SEA Games goal in 2011 when the sport was introduced then. Uh, two years ago, there wasn't a women's competition. Now, what do you think of uh, our hopes? Well, I think the, the gold medal for the women's water polo game is theirs to lose. Uh, at the last year's Southeast Asian Championships, uh, they came very close to losing to Thailand. Mm. We know that Thailand is training extremely hard, and I think our women have to put in the work. Water polo, this time round, will it be the... F uh, we usually win the water polo gold medal before even the opening ceremony. What's the, the plan this time round? Well, water polo will be probably contested at the much later part of the Games and it's because we've had to work out the logistic arrangements to keep all aquatic disciplines mm. at the OCBC Aquatic Centre. Okay, that's our look at, uh, at uh, our Team Singapore Athletes and uh, you know, six, we have about five months to go for the next SEA Games. Let's hope for the best from every angle possible from the organisers, the athletes and of course the support and hospitality of the Singaporeans. Uh, time now for our traffic update. Uh, when we return, we'll chat briefly about Singapore sports in general. Hi, Singapore, and this really is Carl Lewis, and you're locked onto the best in sports on 938 Live. Welcome back to the final stretch of Sports Zone on 938 Live with me, Raj Kumar, and my guests in Lim Tech In, Lao Tio Ping, and Dr. Tan Ning Liang. Now, a few years ago, Vision 2030 was launched in Singapore to primarily allow sports to be a way of life for each and every Singaporean. Uh, take in, we are f 15 years to achieving that overall objective. Uh, where do we stand at the moment? Well, I would say that since uh, Vision 2030 uh, report was uh, released in 2012, uh, we've uh, seen people begin to embrace and understand mm. the aspiration that we set out, that there should be a mindset shift in Singapore, that sport is an indispensable part of our lives, mm. that all of us can live better through sport regardless of our ability mm. or our skill levels. Uh, we have launched the major initiatives, Active SG, Sport Cares. We've put the, in place the Singapore Sports Institute and their plans for the future. I think Vision 2030 is on a roll. And of course, support for the athletes, uh, even in their post-careers. That's right. So you've seen the Specs career 
a scheme and spets business network being uh, set up and announced and companies like Deloitte have come on board and lent their full support. Lao Teoping, organising and staging world-class sporting events is another way of getting Singaporeans involved in sports. Next year seems to be a busy time for you as uh, the Singapore Golf Open is returning, uh, reportedly returning, and there will be three Super Rugby matches to be played at the National Stadium. Could you expand on both the golf and Super Rugby? Well, in fact, uh, it's not going to be next year that I'm going to be very occupied with... uh, This year? It's going to start this year. (laughs) Okay. And in fact... uh, uh, taking off from where Take In uh, commented about 2030 vision. Yeah. In fact, uh, I see the 2030 vision from 2012 as really where they started to bake the cake. Yes. And now, with our sports hub that's already and our facilities world class, I think it's where we now put the icing on the cake. And this is where we have then gone out to seek opportunities to host world-class events. Mm. And one of the events that's going to come back to Singapore, yes, would be rugby. And uh, it's not only the super rugby that Japan will be playing matches in Singapore as part of the uh, commitment towards uh, promoting rugby in Asia. Yeah. Uh, we will also be hosting the rugby world, the, the World Rugby Sevens World Series mm. in uh, first quarter of next year. Okay. And that will be one of the 10 cities around the world in which Singapore will play host to this uh, great event. Yeah. Uh, the, the RB Sevens. The, uh, well, it's the RB Sevens, but yeah. RB is now replaced by World Rugby. Sure. Okay. World Sevens. So, uh, you know, it will all be held at our new spanking uh, national stadium and mm. we will definitely be seeing world-class rugby being played here. Mm. Uh, I don't think that's really the end of it because we're also expecting uh, other world-class matches to take place here and, uh, and fo- following the footsteps of uh, all these other events that's going to be held here. And the Singapore Golf Open? Then the Singapore Golf Open, uh, yes, uh, it's been already uh, <laughs> reported. Yeah. Uh, talks are all going on and I think we are expecting an announcement end of this month with regards to who the sponsor will be and what kind of format and what kind of uh, and who the world class golfers will be coming to Singapore next year and of course not forgetting that we still continue with the HSBC Women's Golf uh, that will take place uh, next month and will continue hopefully from next year for another few more years it's brilliant news uh, Lao Tio Ping Dr. Tan in your opinion does uh, Vision 2030 also truly benefit the pioneer generation as well as uh, other senior citizens well, I think the community sports, you know, in general, uh, definitely have helped the more senior citizens or the senior elders. Mm. But uh, I think it must be true, the schools, uh, where the promotion of exercise, physical fitness and so on, you know, must be vigorously pursued. And if you notice, those elders that continue to participate, whether it's walking, brisk walking, running, and so on, mm. they all will have a foundation of background of some form of sports. Mm. And I think if you really want to push, right, mm. I think it is, I think, the, at the root. And it will be through the schools and the community at large. Take in the idea of forming super clubs, which was. Uh, originally part of the blueprint of Vision 2030. I believe it's been changed. Uh, could you explain the change? Well, Super Clubs was a working title. We've launched the Super Clubs uh, under the banner of Active SG, mm. and that was launched in April last year. And to date, we've recruited about 675,000 members wow. who have signed up. The government has extended a $100 credit to each member that signs up. And we've been very encouraged that up to today, about 60% of those credits have been used. Mm. Half of the members of Active SG are really coming to our sports centers for the very first time. Uh, just to to, to uh, Dr. Tan. Uh, uh, mm. reinforce what Dr. Tan has said, Active SG has reached out to 198 schools and many of them are coming on board with us to partner to enable non-school team players mm. to continue to play sport and we will continue to push that initiative. And reinforcing what Teoping says, last year saw us having about 600 sporting events in Singapore, mm. not just at the highest elite levels like the WTA finals, sure. but right down at the community level as well.
Just one last point, uh, Lao Tio Ping. The Singapore National Games, the second edition took place about three months ago. This idea, uh, do you think it's caught on with the Singaporeans and are we really seeing the locals coming out to embrace sports and competing in friendly rivalry? Yes, I think uh, you know it has been a good start. It's been held now for the second time. Yes. And I hope that uh, we tweak it a little bit so that uh, the people who are participating in, in them would also have a fan base. And I think one way of doing it would be where there is a certain affinity to, say, neighborhood or constituency. And I think if we can tweak it to, to that extent, I think we're going to get greater uh, participation from everybody. Okay, uh, time to round up this uh, edition of Sports Zone. Let's go around the table and get your final thoughts on the Southeast Asian Games, starting with you, in as the chairman of the organizing committee. Uh, what is your message to Singaporeans at this point in time? Well, Team Singapore is not just the athletes. Team Singapore is all of us in Singapore. The rallying call for this Southeast Asia Games and for this year is one Team Singapore. Mm. Let's work together. Chef Dimishon, Tang Ning Liang, your message to Team Singapore athletes. Well, we have always encouraged them you know, that they must train hard, push themselves you know, to the ultimate, make Singapore proud, and then we will then contribute to the success of the 28 Sea Games. And Lao Tio Ping, yourself as well, being a vice president at the SNOC and a former CDM, your message to the athletes and Singaporeans? Well, I think, uh, yes, definitely. Both athletes train hard, work hard, and def- uh, work towards uh, doing honour for Singapore, and I think that's important. I think with that kind of uh, commitment that they are giving, I'm sure the rest of the people in Singapore will also come on and support them. And I think together we definitely will bring on a good games. On that note, thank you very much for joining us on Sports Zone. Mr. Lao Tio Ping, the President of the Singapore Rugby Union, Dr. Tan Ing Liang, the Chef de Mission of Team Singapore at the SEA Games, and of course, Lim Tech In, the Chief Executive at Sports Singapore. Let's hope for a very successful campaign for the Republic when the Games uh, start on the 5th of June. We've come to the end of this final edition of Sports Zone. After 16 years, Singapore's only sports talk show on radio is taking an, an indefinite break. But before we do, here's a big shout out and a thank you to all of our our of our guests over the 16 years, to all of our kind sponsors and clients, and of course to our Sports Zone fans, all 30,000 of you. Thanks very much for standing us, uh, standing by us since the show started in 1998, and we hope you'll continue to stay and support 93 Live when the new programming changes take place from uh, next Monday onwards. So on behalf of my fellow sports colleagues in Noah Tan, Noor Farhan, and of course Andre Achak, who first started the show in 1998, thanks very much for listening to Sports Zone. I'm the Branchman. Take care. Have a great weekend. Bye for now.